The Canadian Minister of Defence admits that there are aliens on Earth. Minister of National Defense, um, I had sighting reports uh, of UFOs. Uh, I was too busy to be concerned about them at the time because I was trying to unify the Army, Navy, and Air Force into a single Canadian Defense Force. And that itself was a kind of uh, battle to the finish. So um, this was not high on my agenda. But about 10 years ago, I started getting interested uh, due to a young man from Ottawa sending me material on the subject. I told him I was too busy to read it, but he had confidence that someday I would. It took me a while to get around to reading it, but I took it uh, for my summer reading in 2005 and um, was really impressed with what was contained in it. And what I thought to myself is there are huge issues here, huge issues. And the American people and the people of the world have a right to know what's going on because they're part of it. It's not just an isolated thing. I accept the invitation of Victor Vigiani, uh, who is over here somewhere, and his uh, cohort, uh, Mike Bird, to speak to a symposium at the University of Toronto. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. That gave me the dubious distinction of being the first person of cabinet rank in the G8 group of company, countries uh, to say so unequivocally. In the 1960s sometime, there was a flotilla of UFOs headed south that crossed into NATO territory in Europe. And uh, the commander in chief of uh, the Supreme Allied, Allied uh, headquarters in Europe uh, was naturally very shaken. Uh, fortunately, or maybe divine providence, before um, the panic button was pushed, the flotilla turned around and headed back north. Uh, obviously, they had thought maybe they were Russian and they were very concerned about it. Anyway, uh, uh, an investigation was launched into this whole subject, and uh, a document was prepared which uh, concluded that at least four species had been visiting Earth for thousands of years. And this is my own. Uh, view at this stage as well. So except for that, there are just a couple of um, things that we've talked about that I'd like to refer to. And one was that we were referring to them as they until this morning when Linda Bolton Howe, I think she was the first one, actually named three different species. I don't think we can any more refer them to them as they because they're not an amorphous mass. They are different species and consequently may have different agendas. I don't think we can say that they all have the ag same agenda any more than we could say that the United States, uh, China, and, uh, and Russia have the same ag agenda. Our real interests may be very similar, but as of now, our perceived interests are still uh, quite far apart. One more observation before I begin what I want to say, and that is that we spent quite a bit of time talking about the 66-year-old cadavers, and I was glad to have Linda this morning finally say that there are live ETs on Earth at this present time, and um, at least two of them probably working with the United States government. I, the seventh, the other species that I learned about uh, not too long ago was called the Tall Whites. And uh, this is when Paula Harris uh, broke the story just a few years ago. And through her good offices, I had the chance to talk for about three hours with former Airman Charles Hall and uh, listen to this absolutely fascinating story of uh, how he was working at first of all, he was scared out of his skin 
But after that, when he got to know them, how he was working with, and finally they became to trust each other and have a good working relationship with the tall whites at the uh, gunnery range at Indian Springs, in Nevada. And these tall whites were living on United States Air Force property and working in cooperation with the United States Air Force and sharing technology with them. He wrote a book, incidentally, called Millennial Hospitality. There are four different versions, but uh, Paula says that uh, Millennial Hospitality uh, number two is the best. I think that's the one I read, and it's a, it's a very interesting read uh, if you want to sort of get inside the, the problem of what it's like to bump into these people floating across the, uh, the terrain in the, in the desert. <coughs> well, enough on that for now. My interest is in full disclosure. And uh, I just, my only caveat is, I think probably I would say 95 to 98% full disclosure. I know of one or two things that I'm not sure should be in the public domain, at least yet. They will be someday, I'm sure, but not maybe immediately. But just as children survive uh, the idea of the, the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus when they become adult, I think that taxpaying citizens are quite capable of accepting the new and broader reality that we live in a cosmos teeming with life of various sorts. The fact that some other civilizations are more advanced than we are may be humbling. It exists and is being kept secret by the same vested interests who control our destiny. Who are these vested interests and what are they up to? Well, Senator, you were talking about a military junta. In my opinion, that is true, but I have broadened and deepened the definition uh, to cabal. And the cabal comprises members of the three sisters, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, and the Trilateral Commission, the International Banking Cartel, the Oil Cartel, members of various intelligence organizations, and select members of the military unit who together have become a shadow government of not only the United States, but of much of the Western world. The aim of the game is a world government comprising members of the cabal who are elected by no one and accountable to no one. And according to Mr. Rockefeller, the plan is well advanced. Does this help you to understand why our civil rights are being taken away from us? I say us, because Canada too was included in the grand plan. So here we are more than a decade later fighting another war that can't be won. There is no country on earth powerful enough to protect its citizens against fanatical hate, as we learn from the Boston Marathon. The mere attempt to pursue the impossible pits neighbor against neighbor and the state power structure against everyone. All of the freedoms won by the millions of men and women who fought and died in World War II are being flushed and unceremoniously down the drain. The only hope of peace is a negotiated settlement. This will require a paradigm shift in American attitudes. It involves a de facto renunciation of the plan for a new American energy and the adoption of a pledge of cooperation with all humankind to build the kind of world which we are collectively capable of. Young people everywhere need to be challenged by a noble cause. They need to be involved in arresting global warming, creating a banking system that is just and sustainable, and lead the way in the transformation to the new reality that we have to live in harmony with our celestial neighbors as well as seeking peace on earth. In a, word, in a word, we have to become spiritual beings and practice the one tenet that the world's major religions have in common. That is the golden rule. 